Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for listening and attending another presentation by the Crime Victims Council of the Lehigh Valley. My name is Lauren Silva, and today we'll talk about making your own luck, coping when things aren't in your control. So before we begin, I always like to start the presentation about giving a little background of the Crime Victims Council. We are a nonprofit, private, comprehensive agency that started back in 1973. We are a comprehensive service because we work with anybody that has been impacted by a crime, as well as their significant others and those who have been impacted by the crime, which could include friends and extended family. We are also the local rape crisis center and we serve in both Lehigh and Northampton counties. All of our services are offered at no cost. They're confidential. And if you are 14 years of age or older, a parental consent is not required to receive our services. So the services that we do provide include direct services or counseling, victim witness, and outreaching the community involvement. Our direct services include individual and or group counseling. Due to COVID-19, of course, we are doing things telehealth. So if you come and receive our services, you would be meeting with somebody over the computer or you would have a phone session. And we are continuing to gather interest for groups who may be interested in connecting with other community members. If you are a victim of a crime, or you know somebody that is a victim of a crime and may need our services, we have court advocates in both Lehigh and Northampton County that can assist you through the court process. They will be with you through any meetings that you would like, trials, et cetera, if it comes to that. Our goal with the services is to empower you and to help you make choices. In order to receive our services, you don't have to already have reported the crime to receive services. If you choose not to report the crime, that is your choice and we will always support you. We can definitely talk about the pros of reporting and what that process will look like, but if you're not ready, that's okay. And then the piece of the outreach and community involvement is what I do. This includes talking to audiences like you about crime prevention, coping skills, controlling anger, healthy relationships, because the idea is that we want you to have these skills in order for you to recognize maybe when you're feeling a little angry or anxious about something and preventing something negative from happening, such as a crime. So violence prevention is a lot of our aim. And we want to just be able to have these conversations with you and hope too that you go to your friends or your family with hope of having better conversations with them. This is our 24 hour 365 hotline. I really encourage you to write it down, have it in your back pocket. Even though you might not need it, maybe you do know somebody who might. This hotline is here for anybody who needs to talk, who needs to vent, and just have somebody on the other line helping them through a situation. If they do call the hotline, you don't have to disclose necessarily who you are. We just want to make sure that you're safe and comfortable and getting what you need from us. So let's talk luck. You know, the one who seems to be climbing to the top at a fast pace has more success flocking to them than the lint on one of your old t-shirts because They've checked off boxes to help them reach their goals. So according to Webster, luck 
is defined as the things that happen to a person because of chance or the accidental way things happen without being planned. So again, there are challenges that people face and according to what we might perceive on social media like Instagram or, or Snapchat, this is necessarily not just their luck or that they're having the time of their life. Their life looks perfect and awesome and that things may just happen to them with minimal effort, but let's hop back into reality for a minute, right? And let's talk about luck or schmuck. There is a big difference between luck and success, right? It happens as you're running to your gate to catch a flight and you end up getting a last minute upgrade to first class, right? That's luck. Or maybe you're in the drive through at Chick-fil-A and you order the last lemonade before they run out. Now, again, not some luck, but success is that feeling, that tingle of excitement about what you do, sticking with what matters through hard times and living a life you can feel proud of. Being lucky suggests people just roll out of bed into a golden pot of success each morning. But you really don't know what someone gave up in order to pursue a goal. And it takes an incredible amount of time when you feel like your workers in vain. So you want to be successful though, but at what cost? Once you reach a certain level of success, sometimes that maintenance can be more stressful, right? Maintaining it, putting on that mask that we're happy all the time, that we're lucky and we, we have to be happy. So the desire to continuously improve is a challenge in and of itself. One that may, that many don't realize come with living on lucky lane. So you don't know what everyone else is going through on their own, right? So the only difference between the person who is busy leaving a quote, seemingly lucky filled life and someone who is living their dream while maybe not always living their dream, maybe, you know, they're stuck somewhere trying to manage, but they're doing something about it. They're continuing to work hard. They're continuing to move forward to make their dreams a reality. And the person that experiences maybe fear, doubt and worry are the ones that still decide to go for it. So what is the secret to being lucky? As research shows, when it comes to really big decisions in life, over analyzing things can actually lower your odds of making the best decision. So trust your instincts, be aware. Studies have actually found that your brain can kind of discern subtle patterns that go beyond our conscious thinking. So our brain kind of understands what is happening when we don't trust our instincts and our stress increases, our hormones are being flooded with maybe that fight, flight, freeze response. So then with some of these insights, it can help you make better decisions because you're taking risks and it takes trust and takes guts to trust your gut. And the more often you do, the better it can guide you because it's that intuition. Don't ignore a hunch or a silence about what's going on internally just because you can't explain them. We like to have control, right? And if we 
are in control, we think sometimes we're better outcomes, but how much is that really serving us, right? Because we're programmed to focus more on what we have to lose than we have to gain. So it explains why so many people stick with situations that leave them unhappy rather than leaving that comfort zone. And of course, there are many valid risks in life and we need to be mindful of them, but dwelling on them can keep us from seeing the opportunity. So push yourself outside that comfort zone and lay your vulnerability on the line for something more important than your pride, right? We expect good things to happen. We have that positive outlook. We see the glass half full and we are embracing failure and we know that it's inevitable. We can't take the good without the bad because then we're not as appreciative. We all have setbacks and we all have disappointments. Such is life. But the people we often think of as lucky don't let bad luck stop them from trying to create more good luck. Lucky people's high expectations motivate them even when they don't succeed because they do surround themselves with good people. So here's the things I can control and things I cannot control. Things that I can control, for example, my words, my choices, my boundaries, what I even eat, limiting my social media, turning off the news, my kindness, my effort, the things I can't control, you know, what others think or believe, the weather, how long a crisis will last like COVID, other people's motives, if other people choose to social distance, how others react, and if someone likes me. I personally believe there are three things that you can focus on every day to ensure you're focusing on what you can control. These are your attitude, your effort, and your actions. If you can do these things, you're focusing on the areas that you can control and creating your own luck. Because if we don't, we tend to have more of a reactive type of response or energy that's put out versus a proactive. When we are reacting, we are focusing on the response to the problem. Whereas a proactive approach focuses on limiting problems before they have a chance to appear and become reactive. So again, we're able to control, we're proactive, where how I'm going to respond, what I can learn, how I treat myself versus reacting is what people maybe post online what others are saying, what people think of you, traffic. We're having that circle of concern consume us. So reactive people are like characters in a movie playing out the script, right? They often resemble powerless victims having their lives run by external factors. They have little control over their emotions and instead their emotions are dictated by someone or something else, by circumstance and the outside environment. So you'll often hear phrases like, oh, if they only treated me a bit better, I could be happy. I have to do this because, or I wish I had more time for that, but we are guilty of being reactive from time to time, often without even knowing it. For most people, it's the default. I know I'm guilty, especially when I put off some of my own homework for class. I'm like, oh, I just didn't have enough time. Meanwhile, I'm choosing to respond 
because I'm watching a show or, you know, I just, I can't do it right now. But when we are proactive, we concern ourselves with things that are inside of our sphere of influence rather than worrying about things that we can't do anything about. We look, to, we look towards what we were able to control and change. And this includes the way we react to a situation. We can't always directly alter how someone else behaves or talks to us. We have no control of the weather. We don't even have a say in how our favorite team will do on the weekend, but we can choose our thought processes and our responses. Being proactive is not a case of being a robot or having no, no emotions, but it's being in complete control over our emotions. We're not blaming. We carry the weather with us, right? It's raining. Okay, it's raining. Instead of, oh, it's raining and it's wet and it's ugly out. Now I have to wear my boots and I have to have my raincoat and I can't forget my umbrella. Proactive people are still influenced by external stimuli, but our response is value-based on their choice or response. So our values, what we hold to us can help us in making those changes to have control over our emotions and being in charge of ourselves. Because again, reactive people, right? They build their lives around emotions. They take on other people's emotions. If the weather is good, they feel good. If it's bad, they feel bad. And they blame circumstances, conditions, and conditioning. So when we have reactive, again, it's, there's nothing I can do. They just make me so mad. Versus, I will, or I can control my own feelings, and I can choose a different approach. So when you are feeling out of control, I always like to use the five senses of grounding. I can control my breathing. I can control my thoughts. I can control my words to myself. I can control my words to others and I can control my body. If you just think about these things before you respond, before you react, take a couple deep breaths. Have those thoughts in your head, right? But choose differently of what's about to come out and how your body is going to respond. If you're feeling a little angsty, and your, um, excuse me, your fists are clenched, you're tense. Let that feeling happen, experience it and let it be because once you notice that, things will start to ease up and then you can cope and move towards accepted, acceptance because it's normal to feel sad, angry, and mad. If you refuse to accept these things and stay angry, it can just lead to more hurt. But if you manage to accept that it is what it is and what's happening right now, your mind can focus on what you can do to make things better. So a more helpful way to cope with things that are out of our control is to practice acceptance, right? Instead of, instead of seeing ourselves as victims or the situation is negative, acceptance can make us feel empowered. Just like I talked about what is acceptance with the weather. It's raining, I don't like the rain. It's always like this, why does it always rain? Versus it's raining, yep. Because I can still have a great day with the rain. So accepting something that's crappy doesn't mean you're giving up or you're giving it a big thumbs up, you, you accept things for what they are. And especially if with friends, you know you're not responsible for their actions and you can't control them. So when they do things you don't agree with, you mostly just get over it. 
it's the same time when you're going through a hard time in life. I know COVID has changed a lot of us in the way we approach life and what we're doing. Things can happen that are totally out of our control. Again, COVID, a relationship breakup, the death of someone you're close to. And it's okay to know that acceptance is not easy. Thinking about something you've been struggling with follows with these next three tips that I'm going to talk about to how you can come to have more acceptance. So imagine what an admired friend or role model will do in the situation. It's normal to be upset if maybe you didn't get the A on the exam, the test that you studied so hard for. And sometimes we get so, so caught up in being upset, we lose sight of the actual situation. So a more helpful response is trying to give yourself the advice a friend might give you. What would you tell them to help them out? Would you judge them or accept them? And if you'd accept them, try using that acceptance on yourself. Writing down your thoughts. Stress can make us think negative thoughts. They might be things like, I always say the wrong thing or I suck at this. Once you're thinking these things about yourself, it's easy to think even more negative thoughts. So it's important to understand that we are not our thoughts. Thoughts may come into your head for a whole bunch of reasons. By accepting that thoughts aren't facts, they lose some of their power to upset us. So try writing down the words that are going through your head. Read them back as if someone else had written them. And it can help realize that your thoughts aren't you and to accept them for what they are, just thoughts. And again, we've all been there thinking through things about I'm not good enough or I'm going to end up alone, no one likes me. Writing these thoughts down acknowledges that they are simply thoughts. They're valid, but you can try reframing them. I just had a thought that. I just had a thought that I'm not good enough is less upsetting and more truthful than the thought itself. So again, validating your feelings, validating those emotions that come up is very important. But acknowledging that they're just thoughts is powerful. And then again, talk to others about how you're feeling. Sometimes we make it worse by judging ourselves for feeling these emotions. And we think that we need to be happy all the time. Or if I'm sad, something is wrong with me. And it's not super surprising that it makes us feel worse. So talking to friends, family, or anyone else can help us feel less alone. And you might feel afraid that saying the thoughts aloud will make them real. But once you start opening up, you realize that it's totally fine to talk about what's on your mind. Sometimes it might even be a relief. Realizing too that maybe other people are going through the same things that you are, again, feel our, can make us feel like our emotions are normal, valid, and it's okay to feel. The better that we get at this through practice, the easier we'll find it when something bad happens and the way we can accept it, the better we will feel. <laughs> because we can have a more positive attitude. We appreciate more, we're compassionate, less worry and stress. We're not as drained and we can embrace change. We can accept what is coming our way and experience new, great, fantastic things. But I want you to know that acceptance is not the same as resignation or passivity. So with acceptance, we continue to push forward despite accepting that things, that there are things out of our control. So we're not just letting things come and we're stuck in that, that rut. We're being passive about it. Acceptance is a positive force that helps us grow better by Chesta Verma. And when we think about how we can control and cope 
it's important to understand our boundaries. So we all determine and define our own boundaries. My boundaries for something might be looser or stricter than your boundaries for something. And it's important for others to know that everyone needs to respect the boundaries that we define, just like we respect others. And it's the importance of the power of saying no. It's very difficult to say no a lot of the times, right? We are always feeling the need to say, yes, yes, I'll do this. Yes, I'll come babysit. Yes, I'll go to the movies with you, even when we're not feeling up to it because we want to people please. But the more we practice saying no, the more we assert our boundaries and know what they are, do I need space? Do I need touch? Do I need to eat healthier? They not only help us with our personal fulfillment, but they can help us with self-care. And boundaries can change and evolve over time. So they don't have to be the same for every situation all the time. And the benefits of setting boundaries is that it contributes to our well being. It gives us some freedom from bad behavior. We increase our self esteem and self respect. And it helps us increase our communication. It has that sense of control, that self control, that build healthy relationships and boundaries are set through some of these steps. Love, right? That we are conveying warmth and we're feeling supportive by our family, that we have this atmosphere of love rather than one that is filled with anger. We have truth, right? We're setting ground rules for ourselves um, and how to treat others respectfully. It also helps us with freedom, right? We have choice in what we accept and don't accept. And then it helps us with reality, knowing what are the consequences if I break my boundary, if I do something that maybe isn't the best and I know it's not. And, you know, we're free to choose and through our choices, we're also choosing our outcome. So we want to continue to set our boundaries by thinking about what do I value and what do I need and how will I honor that? So again, boundaries look different for everybody and they can be negotiated, but it's important to set those boundaries sooner rather than later. So language can be passive, aggressive, or assertive. So think of passive as a turtle in its shell or a mouse that runs and hides. And then we wanna think of a tiger that attacks a bear or roars. And then we wanna think of assertiveness as a wise owl or a calm family dog that barks at danger. So when we're trying to cope, when things are out of control, it's important to have strong communication skills. It's important to have our eye contact because that means that we're showing interest and we're sincere. Our body posture is congruent or equals the body like congruent body language will improve the significance of the message. So if we're sitting up, we're leaning in, we're showing that we are assertive and we're not being aggressive or we're not being passive, but that we have something to communicate and it's important for us. Gestures. I, I'm one that talks a lot with her hands. I'm doing that right now, but you, you can't see me. So they can add emphasis 
and show the importance of assertiveness in your communication. Your voice, is it level? Is it controlled? And is it accepting that it's not intimidating? We're not being aggressive and saying, you need to listen to this presentation, but it's more calm and soothing and our voice can rise and fall based on what we're talking about. Again, then our timing, when do we want to talk about what is happening? What is something that we can do to make it most impactful and maximizes the friendliness of it? And then our content, how, where, and when we choose to comment is probably more important than what you say. It's impact versus content. So we want to, again, strive for that assertive communication because it's the ability to express positive and negative ideas and feelings in an open, honest, direct way. It recognizes our rights while still respecting the rights of others. It takes responsibility for ourselves and our actions without judging or blaming other people. So let's take a look here at passive, the turtle or the mouse. It looks like lack of eye contact. We're looking down, we're avoiding it. And it sounds like, ah, that's fine. I don't wanna get anybody in trouble or I'm okay with whatever you want. When you look at aggressive and then tiger, you know, it's finger pointing, you did this. We're rude, bossy, eye rolling. And it sounds like, again, those statements that begin with you. You can't play with me if you don't play this game. This is what we're doing. You're always doing that. I can't stand it when you do X. But when we're assertive, we're calm, we're respectful, we're making the eye contact. I don't want to play soccer. Do you want to play football instead? Or I feel sad when you say I can't play. Statements that begin with I, because we're taking on our emotions, our feelings, and we're not blaming others. So again, they indicate ownership I statements. They don't attribute to blame. They focus on the behavior and they identify the effect of the behavior. They contribute to growth of your relationships with others. So if you can look over here to the side, you can see a formula, a couple of, I feel because when and what I need is, or I feel blank when you do blank or don't do, because I think it means, and you can choose that, you know, angry, hurt, jealous, sad, specific action, behavior, or that you don't care, consider, or want me. So for example, I feel frustrated when you are late to the movies. I don't have like having to leave my seat to come and find you. So we're taking again that ownership and we're identifying the effect of the behavior of what happens when I have to leave my seat and it's direct and honest. So sometimes less is more. So sometimes something simple is better than something advanced or complicated. So we wanna do more listening, maybe some more salads, more smiling, more confidence, love and gratitude because if we're always thinking our negative thoughts, remember, sometimes we'll think those negative thoughts more and we'll continue to believe in those negative thoughts. So take a step back and remember that you are lucky. Luck depends on how quick we are towards the opportunity, how much desire, passion we have related to something. And it depends on how open we are towards taking chances and how quick we are to making decisions. Luck depends on our decisions and beliefs. And every individual faces different things at different parts in their life. And we all go through ups and downs. 
But people who give up and get defeated by those problems are the ones who are unlucky because they don't have a fighting spirit, right? Lucky people are those who are positive. They believe in positivity. They're solution makers. And people who have the power to visualize themselves in a happy space and they have the intention to go there. So we have the attitude of gratitude. We're thankful for our experiences with that positive outlook. We believe in ourselves and what we have to contribute to our friends, to our family, to the space, to the world. Humanity, kindness, right? We are losing humanity. There's so much violence that is happening. And this world needs people who are kind, humble, and helpful, like you. If you have empathy for others, then yeah, you are lucky. Because having a soft heart in this cruel world is not a weakness, but a strength. And having such strength is what makes you lucky. We're living in the moment. We're not dwelling on the past are focused, we're present, we're accepting. The decisions and not giving up, right? We're accepting fault. We know that sometimes things aren't always going to work out our way, that we might have a failure, we might have a setback, but we learn from it and we move towards the solution. We develop good habits, right? We can know when we're maybe not feeling ourselves, we're getting down in the dumps, but we're practicing mindfulness, we're journaling, we're exercising. And we have strong mentality because your perspective towards life is what makes you lucky if you have a growth mindset. If you see things in a larger perspective, then you're lucky. So for example, fixed mindset people believe that people are born lucky. However, a growth mindset people believe that luck is created by us. Fixed mindset people usually avoid feedback. They live in prejudice, but growth mindset people never fear from feedback and they're usually open-minded. They listen to others and they don't have preconceived notions. We have that mentality of learning never ends. One of my professors has said, if you believe that you have everything you need and that you've learned everything you can in the field that you are in, then maybe it's time to leave your field. Learning never ends. You're always curious. You're always asking questions. You're networking and you have that passion. You have the passion to strive to do your best and to help others. So I 